Welcome to Gunsmoke Theater. I'm Dennis Daly. Very few radio or television programs had such an impact on their medium that they changed everything. One of those shows was Gunsmoke. Yes, it ran 20 years on television, but the TV show was a child of the radio show, which itself ran nearly a decade. Sit back now for the next hour as we go back into the archives and play some of those great episodes of the show that changed everything, Gunsmoke. Well, we've come to the end of a very interesting examination of the radio show that not only broke new ground, but remains the favorite of many, many people. We're talking about radio's gun smoke. We started out with the two auditions that were made back when Matt Dillon was called Mark Dillon. And then when they finally settled on William Conrad, Parley Bear, and Howard McNeil. We heard Georgia Ellis, who would eventually become Kitty in a couple of early episodes where she played somebody else. Then the cast became the cast we began to know and love. We've talked about the actors and the writers and the producer and the director and CBS, and we've been playing some of my favorite episodes as we wind down this series. Now, a recurring element in Gunsmoke was the influence of women in the Old West. Quite often it was a school marm or someone's mother, a woman portrayed in a very positive manner. But now and then the woman involved is a troublemaker and quite often has a very recognizable accent. You know, that's what you had to do in radio. Everybody had to sound different because you couldn't see them. Here's an episode in which a young lady from the South causes more trouble than she's prepared to handle. Dodge City and in the territory on west, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Gunsmoke, starring William Conrad. The story of the violence that moved west with young America. The story of a man who moved with it. Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. I see you received my complaint. I got it, Mingo. Where's Stanley? Where do you think? Upstairs. Brandy? Naturally. She always does mother him when he's in trouble. <laughs> be careful, Marshal. He might be dangerous. <laughs> well, Marshal, you got a sweet word for Dixie? Yeah. Move. Oh, it's not very sweet. It was to the point. <laughs> Say hello to Jim for me, huh? Go away. It's me, Brandy. Matt. Come in, Matt. Join me in a drink? Where is he, Brandy? In the next room. Cried himself to sleep. Save it, Brandy. I gotta take him. Oh, why, Matt? Jim Stanley never did a mean thing in his life. He's no bad man. He stole money from Mingo's roulette table and he threw a bottle at him when he was caught. Mingo's present charges. Stanley can clear himself in court. Huh? Against Mingo's witnesses? Do you bring Stanley out or do I go get him? 
Go get him. But I wouldn't be proud, Matt. Stick to running dance hall, girls, Brandy. Let me run the law, huh? Stanley. Stanley. Hmm. Mm hmm. Oh, it's you, Marshal. I'm sleeping. I want you to come with me, Jim. Come with you? Oh, sure, Marshal. You better get up. Come on. Mm. Come on. Mm. Oh, yeah. yeah. Well, where are we going, Marshal? Would you like to visit my ranch? I got a new coat. The prettiest little soil you ever saw. Jim, she... well, we're going to jail. Jail? Me, Marshal? Do I have to? Yes, Jim. I've never been in a jail. I'm sorry, Jim. No. No. I, I can't go in there. Oh, Marshal, I ain't never been locked up before. Please don't make me... I have to. I... I didn't mean to do it. Honest, I just lost my head when I realized my money was gone. I wouldn't have kept those chips. I know that. I, I just grabbed them. I don't know why. They were there, and I just grabbed them, and then Mingo started in on me. He kept, kept saying things, bad things Take about... Take it easy, Jim. I wouldn't have cared, except that, well, Dixie was there. He kept yelling at me that I was a thief right, right in front of her. I tried to make him stop... And he wouldn't. Then something happened. The, the bottle was there. And... You threw it at Mingo? No. No, I just threw it, Marshal. I was crazy. I, I didn't mean to hurt nobody. I believe you, Jim. Marshal, uh, will you ask Dixie to come and see me later? Yeah, sure, I'll ask her. Thanks. I just want to tell her not to blame Mingo for all this. She might say something or give up her job. Don't worry, Jim. I don't think Dixie's going to give up anything. He won't eat his dinner, Mr. Dillon. He just sits there staring. Yeah, poor devil. He won't really be convicted, will he? Well, I hope not, Chester. Mingo's the one who ought to be in jail. Look, Chester, this isn't exactly my idea of justice either. A shady gambler against a simple-minded horse rancher. Hello, Marshal. Goodbye, Chester. Hmm? Oh, Goodbye. I'll run along. You stay run. put, Chester. Oh, now, Marshal, I want to be alone with you. I sent for you to come and visit Jim Stanley, and you better be nice to him. <laughs> Most fellas are tickled pink if I like them. They say I'm pretty. You're pretty enough. Oh, that's, that's better. I knew you liked me. I said you were pretty. I didn't say I liked you. Oh, now that's nasty. Would you like to hear what I really think of you? No, don't bother. I get the idea. You're Mingo's girl. When I feel like it. Then why do you have to tease a man like Stanley, drive him to drinking and gambling and trouble like he's in now? He's sweet. He thinks I'm beautiful. Yeah. But even men like him wake up. Stick to Mingo. <laughs> Drop in and see if your prisoner was all set for trial tomorrow. Mingo, I want you to withdraw those charges. And let that potential murderer go free? <laughs> no. You got back the chips Stanley took from your table, and his assaulting a man like you is ridiculous. He doesn't even wear a gun. A bottle constitutes a deadly weapon. Look it up, Mark. Why are you doing this, Mingo? Why pick on a man like Stanley? Let's say I don't like him always slobbering over Dixie. 
Archie's private property. For that greedy little vixen he had sent Stanley to prison, knowing that it'll probably crack his mind completely? That's his problem. You don't understand, Mingo. I don't like to see people push you around. Or don't cross me, Marshal. I already have. People get dead that way. Yeah, so I've heard. Now, just who are these witnesses of yours against Stanley? Ned Cole, Saginaw Henry. Both on your payroll. Dixie. Some of the other girls. All working for you, huh? Jim Stanley's as good as convicted, Marshal. There's not a thing you can do about it. Here, man. Drink this. Ah, uh, thanks, Brandy. You know, all you need to do is stop fighting yourself, Matt. You're mixed up. Yeah, that's sure true, Brandy. You know, it's funny when when it's something you can fight with your fists and your guns, it's easy. But how do you fight a deal like this? You've got to clear Jim somehow. Yeah, with those witnesses against him, Jim can't win in court. Technically, he's a criminal. Oh, criminal, my foot. He admits the crimes. The judge will have to sentence him to at least a minimum jail term. We know there are witnesses who can prove he's innocent. Now, a smart man would find a way to make him talk. I've been thinking about it. Well, I'll, I'll tell Jim you were asking after him. I think he'd like that. Mm, he's Dixie's. I had me a man once, Matt. I traded him for a bottle of brandy. Paid a stiff price for my name. You're not through yet, Brandy. Oh, sure. <laughs> I claim mother to everybody. Take everybody's troubles on my shoulders. Help salve my conscience. <laughs> Don't ever hurt a person, Matt. You never get through paying for it. Well, I, I better be going. Where? To try to get some of those witnesses to talk. Hello, Saginaw. Huh? Oh, it's you. I've been looking for you. And you've been looking for trouble. Well, you're beginning to sound like your boss, Mingo. It's late. What do you want? I want to read you something from this book. What book? This law book. Oh, so? First law I see says that uh, anyone giving a drink to an Indian is liable to fine up to $500. I saw you buy an Indian Pete a drink only last week. Pete's a stable boy. He ain't no savage. Law doesn't say savage. Says Indian. Pete's an Indian, so technically you broke the law. You can't make. Next any... one says any man that disrobes in a public place is guilty of committing a public nuisance. Carries a fine of a hundred dollars. Look, what the devil is all this? I saw you breaking a horse down in Harrison's Corral a little while back. You took your shirt off, and that's disrobing in a public place. Technically. You can't get away with this, Dylan. How much you make a month, Saginaw? Fifty, seventy-five. Uh huh. Well, the way it looks, I can get you fined on enough of these laws to keep you broke for about five years. Five years. And we can start all over again. You, you're bluffing. I never even heard of these. Well, laws look for you... yourself here. If you witnesses are going to send Jim Stanley to jail on a technicality, then a lot of you are going to jail the same way. Well, laws may be there, but they ain't fair. All right, Saginaw, if that's how you want it. Come on, let's go to jail. No, uh, wait. Now then start talking. Well, Dixie shilled Stanley into losing his money, and, and me and Ned Cole egged him into grabbing a couple of chips when the wheelman wasn't looking. On Mingo's orders? Sure. Stanley looked down at the chips we swiped, and uh, he reached out to hand them back, and Mingo jumped him. What was Dixie doing? 
Trying to keep from laughing? Yeah, I'll bet. And then what? Mingo rode Stanley hard to make him break down in front of Dixie. And finally, the poor lunkhead seemed to go crazy. He yelled and tossed a bottle at the bar. Not at Mingo? No, missed him by ten feet. Stanley was just working off his mad by busting the bottle. Paid for it, I guess he had the right. Yeah, I guess he had. First, I think Mingo was just deviling Stanley, and then he got the idea to press charges and send him to jail. We got orders out of testifying. Uh-huh. Well, thanks, Saginaw. Uh, Marshal, uh, I'd like you to know something. Yeah? I'm glad I told you about Stanley, because framing him into prison isn't my idea of something to be proud of. It shouldn't be. Ah, good evening, Chester. My, what are you so happy about, Mr. Dillon? <laughs> everything, Chester, everything. Is it about Jim Stanley? It is about Jim Stanley. He's going to clear himself in court tomorrow. Come on, let's go tell him. Well, gracious, that is good news. He couldn't have taken much more of being locked up. <laughs> I know. Hey, Jim, wake up. We're going to break... Jim. Mr. Dillon, he's, he's gone. Both window bars are cut. Yeah. And here's what cut him. A hacksaw blade. And look yonder, there's another. Oh, that fool. Why couldn't he have waited one more day and he'd have been free? Jim Stanley didn't have those hacksaw blades on him, Mr. Dillon. I know I searched him good. You searched Dixie good? Hmm? Oh, mercy, no, Mr. Dillon. She's a girl. He didn't have any other visitors. No, sir. Mingo's going to be awful mad when he finds out his girl helped Jim Stanley get away. Come on. You going to arrest Dixie, Mr. Dillon? I don't know, Chester. First, I got to find her. Return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, every Sunday on CBS Radio, hear both sides debate the issues on Pick the Winner. It's a program that brings in the top people from Democratic and Republican camps, standing their ground and delivering their views on the biggest questions of the campaign. Don't miss Pick the Winner, Sundays between now and November, to be fully informed when it comes time to vote. And remember... Straight through election time, make CBS Radio your election headquarters. Now, the second act of Gunsmoke. Aren't you, Marshal? Where's Dixie, Mingo? Dixie, she's gone. I don't know where she is. You're lying. Well, I swear she disappeared hours ago. I still think you're lying. Dixie's here someplace. No, he's telling me the truth for once, man. Dixie's gone, all right. Are you sure, Brandy? Saw her ride out of town. Was Stanley? Yeah, Matt. The two of them. Dixie and Stanley? Dixie passed him some saw blades. He cut his way out. That rotten double crossing. <laughs> He's your girl, Mingo. I'll be the laughing stock of Dodge City. Good. I hope they laugh you clear out of Kansas. <laughs> it's the last thing I'll do. I'll find her. Both of them. Finding them is my job, Mingo. Go ahead. But you better beat me to them, or you'll be arresting them dead. <laughs> They stopped here, all right. Probably changed horses and got some supplies. That wasn't why Stanley came home. Look, Chester. What? Water in the stock trough is right up to the top. And the barn's open. Feed pulled out where the stock can reach it. Even scared to death, Jim thought about his animals first. Mr. Dillon, you think Mingo's trailing Stanley in Dixie, too? Uh, perhaps. It's one good reason why we better catch him quick. Come on. Oh. 
still no sign. Uh, it looks like we've lost them for good now. What do we do, go back, Mr. Dillon? Well, we can't let Mingo find them. Sure, but the way they've been zigzagging back and forth for the last four days, we don't have a chance in a thousand. I'm not so sure, Chester. Hmm? You know, there's a certain pattern about the way Stanley and Dixie have been moving. I don't think they're trying to leave this section at all. Yeah, we have been getting closer and closer to Dodge with every circle lately. And not only to Dodge. Mr. Dillon, you got an idea? Yeah, maybe. Come on, we'll ride back to Stanley's ranch. You think they came back here? I will soon find out. But from what we saw here before, I'll bet Stanley's not the kind to stay away from his ranch for very long. Whoa! I'm hit the dirt! Behind the trough! Yeah! It's Jim Stanley. There's his horse. Yeah. All right, keep your eyes open. Stanley! Jim, it's Matt Dillon. Let me talk to you. You go away, Marshal. I don't want to hurt you, but I ain't going back to that jail. So you go away now. I'll kill you. Jim, listen to me. I've got a witness. You better leave quick now. Please, Marshal. Mr. Dillon, I'm getting wet. That's better than getting shot. Keep your head down. Yes, sir. Sure is wet. Stanley's in a good position. Closest cover for us is the barn. That's across 50 yards of clearing. That's a long run. He could pick us off before we made 10 feet. Yeah. Jim! I'm not leaving until I've talked to you. Leave me alone, Marshal. Can't you leave me alone? I'm coming to talk to you, Jim. No. No, stay back. I warn you. Mr. Dillon, don't do it. That's a crazy man. That's a frightened man, Chester. I'm coming unarmed, Jim. I don't think you're a murderer, but if you are, this is your chance. Good luck, Mr. Dillon. Mr. Dillon. Stanley's shot sliced across my side like a branding iron. It was all I could do to ignore my fear and keep going. But somehow I reached the ranch house alive. I opened the door. Jim Stanley stood there holding his gun. Jim. I, I, I didn't mean it. I didn't mean it. I, I was only trying to scare you. I'm not a killer. I, I never shot anybody in my life. Honest, Marshal, I, I can't even shoot a rabbit. I know that, Jim. I, I'm afraid... I've always been afraid of things. I try like to be like other people. It only seems to bring trouble. You can stop being afraid of the law and jail right now. That's all over with. You, you mean that, Marshal? Really? Really. But, but I shot you. Did you? Well, I don't recall. Oh, but Mr. Dillon, shot hit your side. Right, right there. You see it? It's bleeding. Now, Jim, listen to me. You didn't shoot me. Oh. Well, all right, if if you say so, Mr. Jim. I say so. Here, I'll take that rifle. Now, let's go back to town and get this business settled, huh? You've been good to me, Marshal. Forget it, Jim. There is one thing, though. Dixie. Oh, she brought me 
hacksaw blade. I know that. She said you were going to hang me and that, that I had to escape. She kept saying that... Uh-huh. Oh, she was riding with you. Oh, where is she now? Oh, they, she left me last night. I was glad. I was nearly wild listening to her talk about you and prison. They even swore I'd kill myself before I'd go back to jail. I'm glad you didn't mean it. Oh, I meant it at the time. Oh, I was sure scared. You feel better now? Oh, yeah. Yes, I know. Everything's just going to be... The rifle slug splashed the side of Jim's face with red and he crumpled into the dirt. From the water trough, Chester opened up and drew the fire of whoever was hiding in the hayloft of the barn. I could see a gun barrel poking out from the side of the hayloft. I picked up Stanley's rifle. Mingo. Keep yelling. Are you all right? Yeah, Chester. But Mingo's dead. Well, how about Jim Stanley, Mr. Dillon? Yeah, he was scared more than hurt. He should come to any minute. Well, my goodness. Oh, this looks like a sure enough war's been happening around here. Where have you been, Dixie? Oh, sure now, Marshal. A, a girl's got a right to look after her uh, investments. Uh, my Mingo and Stanley both dead. Well, now that's a real shame. Hmm? Oh, but Jim Stanley... Uh, Chester. Be... You said investments. The only investment you've made is prison time for helping Jim escape. Me? Well, how are you going to prove anything, Marshal? With Jim dead. But he's... Your Chester, only... why don't you go look after the horses? But Mr. Dillon... Yes, sir? It's a right good thing because I'm going to be terribly busy, you know, taking care of poor Jim's ranch and money and, and of course, the funeral and everything. Why should all that concern you, Dixie? Because I'm Jim Stanley's widow. What? I married him three days ago in this city. It was such a sweet wedding. Yeah, I'm sure it was. And now all I have left are some memories. And, of course, this little old ranch and Jim's money. Dixie, there's something you should know. Hmm? You also got a husband. Have you heard enough, Jim? Enough. Jim! When I saw you fall... You're... Sure bad, Dixie? Oh, Jim, you you mustn't pay no mind to what I said. I, I was upset. Didn't I come back just to be with you? No good, Dixie. Jim's on to you now. Jim, are you going to let him talk to me like that? He's my friend. And I don't like you now, Dixie. Oh, it's too bad. I'm still your wife. Marshal, can she make that stick... Well, by law, you have to support her, Jim. Of course, they don't say how. Marshal, you stop putting ideas in... And, of course, she has to take care of your house for you, Jim. Clean it, do the chores, cook for you. Cook? Me? Cook for him? He can make you, Dixie. It's his right. (laughs) All right or not, I'd like to see him try. He can do it, Dixie. Yeah? Well, he can't if I'm not here. I'm leaving right now. You want to ride into town with us, Jim? No. I think I'd rather stay here for a while, Marshal. If it's all right. Yeah, sure, sure. I'll fix it. But in a few days, when you feel like it, come in and see me, and we'll help you get that divorce taken care of. Divorce? On grounds of desertion. She just deserted you, remember? Chester and I are your witnesses. Oh. Well, thanks, Marshal. I sure do thank you. So long, Jack. Goodbye, Marshal. Bye. Come on, Chester, let's go. Yeah, he's had it too rough out here on the frontier, hasn't he, Mr. Dillon? It, you understand what I mean? It's addled him, sort of. Yeah, I, I guess that's it, Chester. <laughs> Men like him need looking after. Yeah, we got all kinds out here, Chester. 
Come on, let's get back to town. Smoke, under the direction of Norman MacDonald, stars William Conrad as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal. Tonight's story was specially written for Gunsmoke by Herb Purdom, with music composed and conducted by Rex Corey. Featured in the cast were John Daner and Michael Ann Barrett, with Paul Dubov, Vivi Janice, and Bill Lally. Harley Bear is Chester. Join us again next week as Matt Dillon, U.S. Marshal, fights to bring law and order out of the wild violence of the West in Gunsmoke. <laughs> Tomorrow's speakers on Pick the Winner, representing both the major parties, will be Harold Stassen, Republican, and George Ball, Democrat. Listen for this important program, Pick the Winner, tomorrow and every Sunday from now to November. This is Roy Rowan speaking, and this is the CBS Radio Network. Didn't you find yourself really hating that woman? That's what good radio writing does. It gets us involved. That's the name of the game. Now in my year-long examination of Gunsmoke, one of my final favorite episodes, it takes place in and around a stagecoach, which was, of course, along with the railroad, which was just growing in that era, the primary means of getting from place to place, particularly if you couldn't afford a railroad ticket but you had to watch out for whom you met. Around Dodge City and in the territory on West, there's just one way to handle the killers and the spoilers, and that's with a U.S. Marshal and the smell of gun smoke. Smoke, starring William Conrad, the story of the violence that moved west with young America, the story of a man who moved with it, Matt Dillon, United States Marshal. trip from Hayes City to Dodge was long enough horseback, but by stagecoach, it seemed endless. There were only two passengers besides me, and after the first hour on the road, we stopped talking. Just sat there in silence, waiting for the ride to be over. I'd been up late the last few nights, so I braced myself into one corner of the coach and fell asleep. I vaguely remember the stage pulling to a stop and somebody shouting. But I came fully awake when the door was jerked open and a man behind a bandana stuck a shotgun in my face. Get out of the coach. Hands in front of you. Uh, It'll be a pleasure to blast you open. All right. Take his gun, Charlie. Yeah. over there with a the driver. You two next. Now get on out. Don't try nothing. How come you didn't start shooting when they stopped me, Marshal? Well, I was sound asleep, Hank. Well, I'm sure glad of that. If we put up a fight, that fellow with a shotgun would have blowed me clean off the seat. Yeah. yeah. How many up, them are there? Just these two? That's all I've seen. Well, it could be somebody with a rifle hiding in that clump of elder over there. Could be. Ah, that'll learn him, Charlie. Hey, look. He killed him, Marshal. Now, the man was a fool to try that. Go get the box down, Charlie. Take this one to help you. Oh, come on, you. I'll keep an eye on these two here. Oh. You're a marshal, huh? 
I am. Well, that greenhorn got himself killed. He shouldn't have tried to shoot Charlie. No, he shouldn't. Not with a little derringer. Charlie got hit. Right in the arm. Yeah, I saw it. I just don't want nobody chasing us for murder. Under the circumstances, it was murder. It was, huh? Well, then the only thing to do is shoot the whole bunch of you and have done with it. No, you can't do that. Mister, I got a wife and two kids in Dodge. What I hear, Dodge ain't a very good place to raise a family anyway. Look, you're in enough trouble already. Besides, you didn't kill that man. Your partner did. Yeah, that's right. It's Charlie they'll be after. How much money is there in that box, driver? Yeah, I don't know. They never tell me. Man, we'll find out. He's got it open now. Load it in them saddlebags, Charlie. Yeah. I got an idea. You're new at this game. Look, if a man was holding a shotgun on me and I was unarmed, I wouldn't have no ideas about nothing, Marshal. You always carry a shotgun, mister? Why? Well, we might meet sometime when you don't have one. You're going to make me shoot you yet? Hey, look, your partner's ready to go. <laughs> okay. Uh, don't you make a move till we're out of sight. We'll ride back and kill every one of you. You understand? I guess there's nothing we can do but stand here. That's all, Hank. For right now, anyway. What'd you do, Kitty? Burn your mouth again? Oh, darn it, yes. What do you mean again? Well, it seems like you always do. The coffee's hot enough. Thanks for the sympathy. <laughs> as much as you gave me about the stage holdup the other day. All I said was I'm glad you were asleep. You're a lot safer that way. Well, being safe isn't exactly my main goal, Kitty. Yeah, I know. How much money was there, Matt? Two thousand dollars. You'd think they'd have paid a man to ride shotgun. Have you any idea who did it? No, they were both masked. I hear Wells Fargo put up a reward for him. Yeah, there's a thousand dollars for the one who killed the passenger, dead or alive. <laughs> they must want him real bad. That's not good for business. People getting murdered. What about the other one? Uh, Three hundred for his capture. <laughs> and uh, if you recover the stolen money, Kitty, well, they'll give you half of it. If I found that money, they'd give me all of it. <laughs> You'll end up in jail yet. Well, the Texas Trail isn't far from being a jail. For me, anyway. I gotta get back there pretty soon, Matt. Sure. Hey, you. Waiter. Come here and take this money or I'll throw it at you. Another gentleman in town. Uh, Kitty, I, huh? I don't want to turn around. What does he look like? Well, I, I think it's the one with the black beard. You over heard there. me, waiter. Get over here before I bust your neck. <laughs> That's the one, all right. Is there anybody with him? No, he's alone. And he's leaving now. Oh, good. No, no, don't huh? stare at him. I don't want him to see me. Well, he's not even looking this way. He's going out the door, man. Uh, all right, no. come on. I want to follow him. Okay. Is that him ahead of us there? The big man, yeah. Who is he, man? I'm not sure. But he sounds an awful lot like somebody I want. You gonna arrest him? No, not till I'm sure. Maybe not even then. Look, he's going up the docks. Yeah, so he is. Uh, Kitty, I'll leave you here. Okay. Thanks for the supper, Matt. Sure, anything. Tomorrow? Well, I might be real busy tomorrow. I figured that. So long, Matt. Goodbye, Kitty. It's a serious thing. It sounds like his arm is infected to me. Uh, how'd he do it? Well, he, he just tore it on some wire. Well, why didn't you bring him into town? It might be gangrene. Is that bad? Bad. <laughs> he could lose the arm or even die. Where is he anyway? Out on the prairie. Camp. Ain't there uh, some medicine or something I could take back to him? Oh, oh. Oh, hello, Max. Good evening, Doc. Yeah. 
Uh, oh, go, go right ahead. I, I just came up for a smoke. Oh, sure. Sit down. Sit down. Yeah, oh, thanks. Now, look, mister. There isn't a medicine in the world. Never mind. But I'm telling Forget you... Forget it. I'll talk to you tomorrow. Everything's okay. Yes. You better not wait too long. I'm warning you. I won't. We'll take care of everything tomorrow. So long. No, no, that man's crazy. That's right. No, he's not crazy, Doc. No, you should have heard him. I did. What do you mean, you did? I was outside the door, Doc. Well, he's going under the Oliferganza. I guess he isn't too worried. What's this all about, man? Uh, Doc, I'll explain it to you later. Right now, i got to find Chester. Well, Chester, yes, he's down in the office. I just left him. Oh, good. I sure hope he's had a lot of sleep lately. What's that? He's going to be pretty busy tonight. I'll see you later, Doc. Don't you follow him all night, Chester? Oh, Mr. Dillon, I'm about ready to drop. Everything's getting hazy. Where is he? In the restaurant there? Yes, sir, that's where he went. He gambled the entire night. I swear, I don't know how he stays awake. I can't hardly keep my eyes open. Oh, rub a rouser or tobacco juice on him, Chester. That'll help. Oh, my goodness. He just come out the door. Yeah, he's seen us. Stand steady. Yes, sir. Marshal, I, uh, I got a complaint. Now, is that so? Sure is. I had an idea this man's tracking me all night had something to do with you. Oh, how'd you know I was following you? Mister, you might as well have been wearing snowshoes with cowbells tied on them. Now, that's not true. That's a dog. Never mind, mind now, Chester, I... never mind. What is your complaint, mister? Well, you... Can't a decent citizen ride into the Dodge and do a little gambling without being haunted by your man here? Now, that depends on how decent the citizen really is. What name do you go by, anyway? My own. Jermo. Jermo? <laughs> is that all there is to it? That's all. Yeah. Well, Jermo, I just didn't want you to leave town without my knowing about it. Why not? I ain't done nothing. Well, Doc told me about your partner... The one who tore his arm on some wire? What about him? I'm curious to see if you're going to take care of him, that's all. Well, of course I am. He'll die if you don't hurry. Well, I... I'm going after him. When? Well, it's no business of yours when. Anybody following me is likely to run into trouble. From a shotgun, Chairman? I don't use a shotgun, Marshal. Your partner's dying, Chairman. You're wasting time. And he's dying. He's my partner, not yours. I'll take care of him. Sure. Sure, Jim. But you better hurry. We'll return for the second act of Gunsmoke in just a moment. But first, since 1910, the work output of each of us has more than doubled, and the average annual income has gone from $2,400 a year to about $4,000. Yet about 18 hours has been cut off the average work week. These facts add up to the better we produce, the better we live. Now the second act of Gunsmoke. <laughs> Chester had been up all night, so I sent him to bed, and I hired a Kiowa Indian I knew to keep an eye on Jermo. But even though his partner was dying of gangrene from the bullet wound he'd received at the stage holdup, Jermo didn't leave Dodge that day, or the next. He knew I'd track him to their hideout into the stolen money if he did, and he wasn't the kind of a man who'd risk his own neck just to save his partner's life. And since I had no real evidence yet, there was no use arresting him. So, all I could do was wait. 
That Indian is a wonder to behold, Mr. Dillon. He hasn't slept a wink in two whole days, and he don't even look tired. No, but Jumbo looked tired the last time I saw him. Oh, he's been sleeping regular. Yeah, I know. But all this is wearing him out just the same. And he's getting pretty spooky. Well, I should think he would, with what he's got on his conscience. I better ask Satank if he knows another Kiowa who could spell him for a while. I think he's got a cousin around here somewhere. Oh, it makes my bones ache just to think about him not sleeping at all. Marshal, uh, I, uh, I got something to tell you. Huh? Who are you? Well, my name is Verd, but I, I'm nobody, Marshal. Just a cowboy. Well, there's nothing wrong with being a cowboy, Verd. Sometimes there is. Like yesterday. Oh, uh, what's the trouble? Uh, I found a dead man, Marshal, out on the prairie. How'd he die? Well, it looks to me like he got shot. That's why I come to you. Did you bury him? No. No, I... I wrapped a blanket around them, though. Now, where is he, Bert? Not far from here. Maybe 15 miles? Yeah. Chester. Yes, sir? Get our horses. We'll ride out and have a look. Yeah, he's still there, Marshal. Nothing's been eaten on him. He sure got himself hid out here. Why? It's a wonder anybody ever found him. Uh, Bird, you, uh, you, you want to take the blanket off of him? Sure. There. Yeah. Uh, uh, how did you know he'd been shot? Well, his arm, it's all swollen up, Marshal. And then, you see here, I noticed that bullet hole in his sleeve there. Yeah. Well, looks like you've made yourself a thousand dollars, Bird. What? Wells Fargo offered it for this man, dead or alive. He robbed the stage a few days back. He did? Well, ain't I in luck. And there's another thousand for whoever finds the money he stole. It's probably buried around here somewhere, don't you think, Mr. Dillon? Hey, that reminds me. I noticed uh, something funny over there in the mand hills. Like the ground being dug up. Show us, Bird. Yeah. Sure, Marshal. Right over here, wait. There. See it? Right there? Right by that big one? Yeah. Well, I declare. <laughs> by golly, I think he's right, Mr. Dillon. Yeah, there's something been buried here, all right. Yeah. I think I can... Yeah, there, there it is. There, I got it. Hey, looky there, Marshal. It's, it's a money bag. And I found it, didn't I? Yes, sir. That's right, Bert. Here, look at that. That's real money, all right. Marshal... I found it, so I, I, I get the reward, won't I? But I knew where it was. Yeah, you sure did, Burton. We dug up the rest of the money and then made the hole into a grave. And we buried the dead man right there. On the way back to Dodge, I told Bird he could talk all he wanted about finding the bandit's body and the reward he'd collect for it but that he wasn't to say a word about the money we'd recovered. He couldn't understand why, and I didn't explain it to him, but I warned him he'd never get a penny of either reward if he didn't do as I said. Back in town, I didn't let him out of my sight for the next two days. I figured it'd make Jermo pretty worried. And it sure did. <laughs> you know, it's mighty good to get off of that prairie just for change. I should think it would be. <laughs> you don't come to town much, do you? I've never seen you around here before. Well, I, I've been too broke, Chester. Well, sir, it sure takes money to see the elephant in Dodge nowadays. <laughs> I'll be able to afford it soon enough. Ain't that right, Marshal? Ah, it looks that way, Bird. Yeah, you've been mighty lucky. <laughs> So far. What do you mean, so far? Nothing. Nothing. Evening, Marshal. Ah, hello, Jermall. Uh, 
This the fellow who found your bandit for you? Yeah, I was just telling him how lucky he is. Yeah. You know, all that reward money. Thousand dollars, isn't it? Yeah, yeah, that's right. Is that all you're getting, mister? What do you, what do you mean, is that all? Well, there was more reward than that offered. Oh, you mean the stolen money. Oh, it's too bad about that, wasn't it, Bert? We, we didn't, we didn't find no stolen money. You didn't? Oh, but look everywhere. There'd been some digging nearby, but uh, <laughs> there was nothing in the hole. Yeah. Well, now, what do you make of that? Just plain disappeared, huh? Yeah, yeah. Looks that way. Well, that's sure too bad, ain't it? But you can't have all the money in the world, mister. I ain't got all the money in the world. I'll see you later. Marshal, I, I, I did like you told me. I, I, I didn't say nothing. You did fine, Bert. Just fine. <laughs> We left the saloon a little later. I noticed Germo standing in the darkness of the alley, waiting. I was pretty sure he'd follow us as we crossed the plaza and walk up Front Street. When we reached Kelly's stable, Bird wanted to go in and see if his horse had been fed, so we said goodnight and left him there. Chester and I walked on a little ways, and we turned off the street. We went back entered the stable from the rear. Inside, we could hear voices. And we sneaked up from stall to stall until we were close enough to make them out. Tell me where the money is, Bird. What did you do with it? I told you, Jim. Well, the marshal's got it. We dug it up. You're lying. Now, who turned in $2,000 to collect $1,000? You stole it and hid it somewhere in there. No, I didn't. I tell you. The marshal himself said there'd been some digging nearby. What'd you do with it, Bert? Now tell me before I kill you. No, no. Listen a minute, Jermo. Look, when you didn't come back, see, I, I figured you got caught. And then Charlie died, and I got scared. Yeah, and you know, always was a coward. That's why we left you in the bushes with a rifle when we stopped the stage. No, that don't matter. But look, Jermo, don't you see this way? We're both safe. But I'll, I'll split both the rewards with you. You know I will. You're lying. And I'm going to kill you for it. No, no, don't. You're... Hold it. Come out. Come out. Uh, uh, you're next, Marshal. <laughs> you should have had your shotgun, Jermo. I should have. Killed you with the holder. That was my big mistake. No. If you'd have trusted Bird, you both could have got by with us. He was telling me the truth? He was. <laughs> and you'd have never been convicted on what evidence I had. Well, I guess every man's entitled to, to make a few mistakes. Marshal. <laughs> Gemma. Well, you won't make any more. drop me a line. Here's my email address. It's newscaster, N-E-W-S-C-A-S-T-E-R, newscaster at earthlink.net, newscaster at earthlink.net. Meanwhile, thanks for listening. (laughs) 